Hello again. Back in September 2008, before we had kids, Carrie and I were getting ready for a vacation to Gatlinburg, Tennessee. You know, we were renting a cabin for the week in the Smoky Mountains. Leading up to the vacation, we decided that we would not go to the grocery store uh, the preceding week so that the fridge would be completely empty while we were away. So by that Sunday, we were going to leave uh, early on Monday morning. All that was left in the freezer was one pint of Ben and Jerry's ice cream that I planned on eating during Sunday night football. Uh, so that, that morning, I preached uh, at my little church in Indiana, which was about an hour away from our apartment. And I got home just to relax and watch football for the remainder of the day, like I do. Uh, and I didn't have direct TV Sunday ticket or anything like that at the time. I was living in Cincinnati, mind you, uh, so I couldn't watch the Eagles. Uh, I had to watch the Bengals versus the Titans. Excitement. Uh, the game started off like, a, like any average game does, with, with the wind speed being 21 miles per hour. Why are you telling me the wind speed of the game? Uh, why, did, why did I mention the wind speed? Because by the third quarter, things had drastically changed there in Cincinnati with the wind, wind speeds increasing to 70 miles an hour on the field. The teams could not throw the ball. The teams could not kick the ball. Punts were like going backwards. Uh, extra points uh, at that time, which were super close since they've changed the rules, they were being blown off the field. Just extra points being blown off the field. It was quickly becoming a disaster. I mean, it already is. It's the Bengals. Or was. I guess they went to the Super Bowl last year, whatever. Total chance. Uh, but uh, both on and off the field, because things were going uh, awry in Cincinnati all over. I can't remember if I actually made it through the whole game or not before the power went out at our, at our apartment. Winds blew through the rest of the, the day into the evening. You could hear things blowing around, trees knocking over and things of that nature, uh, and, and the power stayed off. Uh, thankfully, uh, at that time, I mean, even now, our cell phones were our, our form of alarm clock. So we woke up early to head out on our vacation to a, a powerless apartment. But don't worry, I ate that Ben and Jerry's before it melted. I just, just want to make sure you just want to make sure you knew that. But in the morning, the morning that we were to head out on our vacation, the power was off, and we packed the car and and headed out uh, south towards Tennessee. My original plan uh, was to fill up the gas tank on our way out. That'd be our first stop at the, the gas station on the corner just before getting on on the highway. They were out of power, uh, so we had to just. You know, I continue to trek on down 75 and, and, and pray that, that we found another gas station. But heading down the highway, we noticed uh, just wind damage everywhere. Uh, debris, down trees, destroyed signs, and, and evidence of destruction all throughout the land. And still, each, with each passing exit, the signs were off. The power was out at the, at the gas stations. We crossed into Kentucky uh, over the Ohio River, still finding power outages all along the way. Each passing exit, no power, no power at the gas stations. It wasn't until we were pretty far down south into Kentucky, running on fumes essentially on, on, in our gas tank, that we found power, that we found a gas station that, that had power. Hurricane force wind storms uh, that came through Cincinnati were easily the, the biggest problem in 2008 at that time, with damage in, damage in the area estimated around a billion dollars total. In retrospect, knowing that and, and coming home, finding out all that information while we were away on vacation, our minor gas inconvenience at the time seemed silly to even complain about or even to mention now, but compared to what people went through while we were gone on vacation for the week. The storm, which was only one mile per hour away from being a Category 1 hurricane, ended up leaving more than a million people without power. Um, mainly for that week we were gone, and, and some people even uh, more than a month long. Sometimes in life we face storms. Sometimes in life we, we go through difficult times and, and difficult circumstances, tragedies. Sometimes we, we face major life-changing life decisions. Situations that, when we're in them, we find ourselves without power without power to do anything, without, without the power to change the, the surrounding circumstances, without the power to alter 
whatever the it outcome might be for us, without the power to stop the consequences from doing damage in our lives. And we just don't know what to do. We're powerless. Second Chronicles 20, verse 12. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And this is so... This is one of the reasons why it's so important for us as Christians, no matter when we're living, no matter what century we're in, that we continue to to pour back into Scripture, that we continue to, to, to page through the history of God's worshiping people. And this is one of the, the major reasons, not just to have head knowledge, not just to feel like we're, we're, we're on track or checking a checkbox or whatever it might be. This is one of the major reasons that we dwell in Scripture. Because in Scripture, we are invited to see firsthand someone in a faithful relationship with the Lord. And we see within that context them in a struggle, them going through a hardship, them faced with sin, them going through the the death of maybe someone they love, with feelings and emotions that maybe we can relate to, with feelings and emotions of being completely powerless in some of life's situations. And we've been there. Most of us, us, if not all of us, have been there too. Most of us are familiar with with tragedy. Most of us are familiar with with tough times, with distress, with, with stress, with danger. And so this scripture helps teach us. Scripture teaches us and it and it informs us while forming us on how to seek God when going through life storms. This morning, we'll continue in this this summer series entitled Made to Worship, where we've been focusing on the fact that worship cannot be confined. It can't be confined to just just one hour. We say week after week that, yes, we call this a worship service, but this isn't the only worship that we partake in day after day, week after week. It's something that has become, as Christians, our ultimate vocation and our utmost joy as human beings something we were made to do, we were made to worship. Last week we explored together the actions of of King Asa. Asa claimed that God was the center. God was was the the center of his life, the core of his life, and he backed up those claims not just by by saying them, not just speaking them, but he also, he, he did it. He let his actions speak louder than his words. This morning we continue in this this kingly lineage by turning to his son, Jehoshaphat, the fourth king in the, the kingdom of Judah. So let's read. Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 13 through 17, verse 6. Then in the 41st year of his reign, Asa died and rested with his ancestors. They buried him in the tomb that he had cut out for himself in the city of David. They laid him on a bier covered with spices and various blended perfumes, and they made a huge fire in his honor. Jehoshaphat, his son, succeeded him as king and strengthened himself against Israel. He stationed troops in all the fortified cities of Judah and put garrisons in Judah and the towns of Ephraim that his father Asa had captured. The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the ways of his father David before him. He did not consult the Baals, but sought the God of his father and followed his commands rather than the practices of Israel. The Lord established the kingdom under his control, and all Judah brought gifts to Jehoshaphat so that he had great wealth and honor. His heart was devoted to the ways of the Lord. Furthermore, he removed the high places and the Asherah poles from Judah. So Jehoshaphat followed in the worshiping ways of those who came before him, following the ways of, of David and those who came before him. He did not seek false gods. He did not follow after false idols. He sought God. He sought God and, and God alone, and he followed in the ways of the, of the Lord, in the worshiping ways. And Jehoshaphat and his community in, in Israel, they benefited because of that. They benefited from his godly leadership, his godly kingship. Now, we're going to jump through through chapter 17 through 19, and, and, if, and if you'd like, and I do highly suggest it, that you read that yourself this week. We're just going to kind of jump through it 
really quickly, so you don't want to miss that, so, re so read it this week. But what I want you to know is that Jeho Jehoshaphat faced trials. He faced temptations. He faced difficulties and difficult times during those chapters, and you'll, and you'll read that. Like his grandfather and father before him, he faced temptations on how to act. He faced temptations on how to behave when everything is prosperous, when everything is going well. And for me, chapters 17 through 19, drive home the importance. I want you to hear this. Drive home the importance of staying connected to the Lord during every circumstance of life. Staying connected to the Lord during every circumstance. The good times, especially the good times. So that you know what to do during the bad times. The good times, the bad times, the ugly times. When a crisis breaks out in your life, when, when, when someone passes away, when you are faced with a tragedy, when you're faced with an illness, when something happens in your life that's completely out of your control, you name it. There's a thousand things that could go wrong in your life. If, if that's the time where you turn to God and you've never turned to God at any point other than that time in your life, never before in your life have you turned to him until the tragedy strikes, it will be awkward. It'll seem unnatural. We don't want that. We want to turn to someone who feels like a, a trusted friend, someone who's always been there for you, someone who loves and cares for you, someone that has a history with you, someone who, who's comforted you the whole way through. You'll either experience this time as unnatural or awkward, or you'll simply not know what to do. Or maybe you'll approach with this bad circumstance before you, but with a whole load of guilt, too. I'm sorry, Lord, that I haven't really come to you at, at all and, until this point, but here's what's going on in my life. Don't let the difficulties in life be the only time you seek the Lord. This isn't the best metaphor. This is what I've got this morning. When is the best time to practice a tornado drill? When is the best time to practice a fire drill? When is the best time to practice any one of those types of drills? During a fire? During a tornado, during whatever tragic circumstance we're, we're going to talk about here? No, of course not. The best time to practice the, the most dangerous times in life are when it's calm, when it's peaceful. All right, let's look at another metaphor, if that one isn't, if that one isn't good. Let's, one, let's look at a metaphor that the Apostle Paul is familiar with in his life. I'm not a huge boxing fan myself, um, but I used to follow those Evander Holyfield, Mike Tyson fights back in the late 90s um, when I was a kid, and I remember reading, I remember reading that Holyfield, uh, for some reason there was an article on him, would train six days a week, 10 hours a day. Six days a week, 10 hours a day, weight training, heavy bag work, cardio, Strict dieting, plyometric exercise, and on and on and on and on it goes. Six, six days a week, 10 hours a day. Six days a week, 10 hours a day for a match that has rounds that are only three minutes. You're dedicating your entire life full time to, to rounds that last three minutes. Six days a week, 10 hours a day, to step into a ring for three minutes at a time. And yeah, I know there's multiple rounds, but three minutes at a time. The training becomes your life. The training becomes everything that you, you think about and every, essentially everything that you do, while the match is simply a, a, a culmination of all those skills, all that dieting, all that training that you've worked on for the past six to eight months. And this concept spills into to many aspects of your lives. Maybe you're not a boxer. Maybe there's no boxers here this morning. But maybe you play piano or you, you play an instrument of some sort. Uh, it's not the piano recital or the whatever recital you, you're playing your instrument in. That's not what makes you great. It's the hours and hours and years and years of training and practicing and, and working on uh, those skills. So before we in, in, encounter the type of storm that emerges in 1 Chronicles chapter 20, I want you to, to, to digest or, or let it dwell with you for a moment the importance of 
seeking God always before there's ever even a hint of a storm. Maybe even six hours or six days a week, ten hours a day. Practicing daily presence. And that word isn't an okay word. Practicing. Practicing. The daily presence of God. Communing with him daily in prayer. Open to correction. Open to, to, to correspondence. Regular times of praise and worship outside of, of a Sunday service. Turning to him essentially in, in all occasions. When these things become who you are, and may, they, may t- they may take training, practice. When these things become who you are, when these things become natural, when these become like second nature in a way, like a well-trained boxer conditioned, conditioned to go all 12 rounds if need be, like a, like a well-trained pianist, our movements with the Lord become instinctive reflexes of who we are. We might not know what we're going to go through. We, we don't know the future. We might not know what we're going to go through, but we certainly know who we're going to go to. Second Chronicles 20, 1 through 4. After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites with some of the Mayunites, came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom on the other side of the Dead Sea. It's already in Hazan Tamar, that is En Gedi. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. So as the the chronicler tells this story, the vast army isn't just on their way. These these towns and these places that he's mentioning here in, in Scripture, they've already crossed the border. They're just over the horizon line. And this is truly a terrifying moment. Last Sunday, we were given this number, uh, thousands upon thousands, or in Hebrew, it could possibly mean thousand times a thousand, um, a million guys, essentially. This time, we're not even given a number. We're, we're told a vast army, a vast army, which is a clue uh, to me that I imagine, and since we're not given a number, that means that there's a lot more than just a million guys. And they're just down the road. They're just over the hill. And they are armed for war. And they are ready to destroy you. And so in this great storm that is building just over the horizon for Jehoshaphat and the people of Judah, in this moment of great distress, in this terrifying moment, what does Jehoshaphat do? Jehoshaphat responds in a way that we need to, to, to learn from and that we need to carry with us in our lives because when we're willing, whether we're willing to admit it or not, we're going to face some tough times in our life. Maybe you're going through something right now. You're going to face stuff in your life. In verse 3, let's read it again. Alarmed. Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The word here translated alarmed is the Hebrew term yare. Yare. It means to fear. It means to be afraid. Jehoshaphat receives word that this vast army, these guys who are ready for war, who are armed to destroy, is streaming across the border just over the horizon, and what does he do? The first thing he does, the first thing he does is he's afraid. He feels scared. He's alarmed. He's he's in fear. Church, that, that just gives us permission, and I want to give you permission this morning to be afraid in times of fear. It's okay. We don't all have to be Schwarzenegger and Stallone and be tough guys. We can be afraid when scary things come our way. 
is in that fear, in that distress, in that alarm, it's a, it's a trigger, it's a signal for us to turn to the Lord. Human emotion is, is okay. Jehoshaphat doesn't shake his head and just say, no, 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 no. Faith over fear. Faith over fear. I'm good. Jeho- Jehoshaphat doesn't pretend that nothing is happening. I'm Jehoshaphat. There's no way that could happen to me. God is on my side. Jeho- Jehoshaphat doesn't bury his head in the sands and, uh, you guys don't know what you're talking about. No, he hears the report and he feels afraid. He hears the report and he feels afraid. And that's a perfectly okay human reaction. When tragedy strikes, when disaster comes, when you're faced with terrible news, it's okay to be afraid. You might just feel afraid. You might just tremble with fear. Those things happen. That's reality. If you're going to go face to face with Mike Tyson in the ring, no matter how much Evander Holyfield trained six days a week, ten hours a day, I don't care. You're going to fear. You're going to feel fear. I mean, the guy bit his ear off. You're going to feel fear. That's scary. The question becomes, what are you going to do with that fear? Is that going to motivate you to just to protect yourself and to, to do what you need to do in the ring? Is it going to motivate you to seek out the Lord? To let those situations of fear trigger in you a response to seek God, second, after you feel that fear. Jehoshaphat is afraid. He resolves in in that moment, this fear is leading me to the Lord. This this fear, this emotion, this this, uh, feeling of alarm is leading me straight to the Lord. He sets his posture towards the Lord. He resolves to pursue the Lord through the fear and in the fear. And he worships God. And he worships God in the form of fasting. Fasting is a treasured spiritual discipline. As Richard Foster says, quote, Fasting is the voluntary denial of an otherwise normal function for the sake of intense spiritual activity. Fasting helps to to quiet our souls. It helps to quiet ourselves down, always clamoring for something, always feeling the need for for something, whether that's food or or self-preservation, whatever it might be, it quiets the clamor of our souls. It quiets the self-care to affirm instead our dependence on the Lord God. Fasting quiets us so that we can hear the Lord. Joseph in fear turns to God, and why does he seek God in this stressful moment? Why is he seeking God in this fear? Because he's in the habit of doing so. Because he's in the habit of spending time with the Lord, of seeking the Lord always. Because God has be- seeking God and being with God has become just a part of who he is on a daily basis. Seeking God is a practice of the heart. Seeking God is a, a, is a characteristic of who you are in Christ Jesus. So King Jehoshaphat calls together the community. He said, we're all going to fast, folks. We're all going to fast. So they gather together for worship. Verses 5 through 7. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard and said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand and no one can withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the the descendants of Abraham, your friend? So first, Jehoshaphat, after gathering these people together and fasting and and worshiping, he recognizes in his prayer, in his worship, he recognizes who God is. He tells God of of what he's done in the past. He tells God of of how glorious and wonderful and powerful he is. A God who is almighty. A God who is almighty in power. A God who who keeps his promises. A God who has established a covenant with these people. That's a great suggestion on how we can pray in our lives. Start by praising. Start by telling God of of the history of what he's done. Not only through his people, 
but through you. What has God done in your life? And repeat that, that narrative. Repeat that story in your prayers, reminding yourself while telling him of what he's done for you, what he's done in your life. Jehoshaphat remembers God's actions in his life, in the history of God's worshiping people, and the promises that came along <coughs> with it. And, it's, and, it, and we've talked about this. This is why the theological vision of Chronicles is so important, as it points to and it focuses on God's close proximity to his creation, how close God is to us. And the truth that human beings are meant to be with God, and we are meant and made to worship. The worship of God is the center of our life together in him. So with God enthroned and ever so close to us in our mindset and in all reality, it means that in just a millisecond, we have the option to, to turn to him. We don't have to seek very far. We don't have to scour through through all the pages of scripture, we know that he's right here. And we can turn to him in a moment, in just a breath. And he knows what's going on. And he's with us and comforting us. When the storms of life come our way, God is just a breath away. Second Chronicles 20, 8 through 12. They have lived in it and they have built a sanctuary for your name, saying, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment, or plague, or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name. We will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. But now here are men from Ammon, Moab, Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Church, may we learn from this example. This is a prayer that we, we must incorporate in our own lives don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. How often do we fill our prayers with all the things that we want exactly the way we want them? When in all reality, we don't know what to do. But our eyes are on you. Church, when the storms of life approach, we will always be faced with the temptation to come up with our own solutions. We will always be faced with the temptation to rely on ourselves, to rely on our own strategies, to rely on our own power, to have it all figured out, and then ask God to do it that way. Which unfortunately can lead us to making decisions that are no good for us, or making decisions that are way too quick, way too rash, that could lead to even more problems in our life. God, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. When we're in distress, let's get in the habit of asking God to be God. Asking God to act. Asking God to, to work in his will. To ask God to fulfill his promises. For him to do what we cannot do. For him to execute righteousness where and when needed. For him to deliver us from, from peril. For him to empower us when we feel powerless. And sometimes for him to reform or to, to form us and to refine us through the storm. Some of the storms that we face in life are meant to change us and to shape us and to build us. We might not understand in the moment. If we incorporate this type of prayer into our lives, are we bold enough, courageous enough, faithful enough? <laughs> to pray prayers like this, to let God be God. I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. And what does God do with this prayer? He responds, verses 13 through 17. All the men of Judah, with their wives and children and little ones, stood before the Lord. 
Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jahaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Madaniah, a Levite and descendant of Asaph, as he stood in the assembly. He said, listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the edge of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your possessions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out and face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. When the storms of life come our way, cling to our almighty God. The almighty God who is, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. When we read this account of, of Jehoshaphat, we hear echoes. If you've been in scripture, you hear echoes of what has come before, of the history of God's worshiping people. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. The battle is not yours, but God's. This triggers, maybe in our, in our memory, Moses and him bringing the Israelites out of Egypt. That battle was not theirs. It's set, set against the sea on one side and then Pharaoh's chariots rushing against them on the other. Exodus 14, 14 says that the Lord will fight for you. The Lord will fight for you and you just need to be still. The same concept, the same echoes, the same God is, is working in his people so many years later. Church, you and I have this amazing gift, this beautiful gift of knowing the history of God's worshiping people. And we get to stand in it. And we get to dwell in it. And we get to be a, a part of it. We have the, the beautiful gift of a deep memory. Beautiful gift of a deep memory. Church, if we've never gotten into the habit of seeking him or if we've forgotten what God has done or what he has done in scripture and what he's done through his people for thousands of years, every storm will feel like the first in our lives. And every storm will feel like the worst. When the storms of life come, we can cling to scripture. We can, we can cling to the comforting words of scripture. Go out and face it. Go out and face it tomorrow and the Lord will be with you. And following this amazing promise, the people do what they were made to do. And we should do what we were made to do, and that's worship the Lord God. Verses 18 through 21. Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down and worshiped before the Lord. Then some Levites from the Kohathites and the Korahites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Amen. Church, this is an absolutely incredible sign of faith. This is an absolutely incredible sign of trust. Sen it's, this is a, it's not a joke. They're sending out the worship team in front of the army. You guys okay with that? They're sending out the worship team <laughs> in front of the army. Hallelujah. <laughs> what a promise to keep with us. The key to victory is worship. The key to victory is worship. When life's storms begin to rage, we send worship out in front. We 
hold back the, the urge to send out armies and, and our plans and our strategies, and we send out worship. How often do we do that? We weren't made for self-preservation, folks. We weren't made for war. It's a tragedy that there's ever been war. We were made for worship. I hurt for humanity. That's why sin is, is mortifying. We weren't made for any of that. We were made to worship. To worship. Verses 22 through 30. As they began to sing in praise, the Lord sent ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The Ammonites and the Moabites rose up against the men of Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. After they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped to destroy one another. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked toward the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. So Jehoshaphat and his men went off to carry, went to carry off their plunder, and they found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing and also articles of value, more than they could take away. There was so much plunder that it took three days to collect it. On the fourth day, they assembled at the valley of Baraka, where they praised the Lord. This is why it is called the valley of Baraka to this day. Then, led by Jehoshaphat, all the men of Judah and Jerusalem returned joyfully to Jerusalem, for the Lord had given them cause to rejoice over their enemies. They entered Jerusalem and went to the temple of the Lord with harps and lyres and trumpets. The fear of God came on all the surrounding kingdoms when they heard how the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. And the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. Jehoshaphat and, and his people and the community, they didn't have to fight. They didn't have to war. They, they didn't even need to unsheathe a single sword. The battle was the Lord's. The only thing that was required was worship. It was worship. Church, we need this vision in our lives. We need the theological vision of, of a book like Chronicles running and weaving through our lives. This, this, this strengthens us. It strengthens our faith. It strengthens our trust. It shapes and it molds our reactions and our behavior. When someone cuts you off in traffic, and you want to cuss and you want to flick them off, whatever you want to do, send out worship instead. Lean on the history of God's worshiping people. When the battle comes, when the storms come, when the, the, whatever it might be, the tough times, the difficult times, the tough decisions, the anger, the anxiety, whatever it might be, let the history of God's worshiping people inform your present and influence your future and send out worship. George, if we've taken anything away from this morning, I implore you, Get in the habit of seeking God before the storm ever comes. Get in the habit of seeking the Lord so that when the storms of life rage, turning to him and returning to him is just as natural as breathing. Life's toughest moments follow the example of, of Jehoshaphat. Lord, we don't know what to do. And it's okay to say that. Lord, we do not know what to do. I don't know what to say in this situation. I don't know how to act in this situation. I don't know what to do in this situation. I'm just going to keep my eyes on you. I'm going to keep my eyes on you, Lord. We need this this morning. We need this individually. We need this as families. We need this as a church. We are a people who do not retaliate or react with our own strength, our own strategy, or our own brute force. We are a people who with God's power, with God's power can stand firm, can be unshaken, and can see the salvation that he has paved through us. So we just stand in all of that and we worship. When the storms of life are bearing down upon us, 
we hear the words of Scripture. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out and face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Church, if you've never accepted Christ Jesus, if you're here this morning, you've never accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, if you've never been baptized for the forgiveness of sins, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, starting a new life in him, if God is leading you down that path, respond. He is with you. If you, Maybe you want to make Hillside your church home. We'd love to have you. Either one of those options are for you or if God is leading you in that direction, would you come forward here this morning as we all stand together and continue in our worship?